What's up, Iron Investors? Welcome back to another epic episode, ICN Talks, the podcast where we aim to interview C-level executives, founders, real builders in our industry, Web3 industry, blockchain industry. In today's conversation, guys, I have a very special guest. I'm calling him the founder, the man, the myth, the legend. I think nothing above in our industry. And uh, please welcome Yatsu, the founder of Animoca Brands. Thank you so much for coming back again to, to ICN Talks, part two. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it was a great talk last time, so I, it's a real honor to be here again. Yes, absolutely. You guys, if you know nothing about Animoca Brands accidentally, you literally don't deserve any profit in this industry. So watch the episode till the end, then go uh, find Google uh, Animoca Brands and then uh, start investing a little bit. <laughs> Is this the right path of investing in the industry? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, generally, I guess, yeah. do your own research. I would say that uh, I think today we are a pretty strong voice in Web3, right? I mean, we have over 450 investments in the space. We keep investing and growing. And, you know, we are big builders in the space as well, together with, you know, all of our portfolios and subsidiaries. But, you know, I still meet people who are like, oh, I've never heard of you. Or, um, you know, I mean, I mean, in our industry. And it just shows that our industry still has a lot of room to grow, right? And, you know, it sounds crazy today, but I remember, you know, in the early days of the internet when I first started off, uh, you know, Google was a small startup, and even when they became really big, uh, people still didn't know who was Google, even though they were in the internet, right, so to speak, right, of it's all part of it. But I think if you are wanting to know about the industry, uh, it's not just us. There's many major players in the space that you ought to know about. You don't have to agree with us, but you should know what we're doing. And I think that's true for everything in life, right? If you're playing, you know, um, in the Web2 space as well, you don't have to agree with Google or Apple or Microsoft, but you do have to know what they're doing, for instance. If you don't, then how can you navigate the market? How can you understand how to build your business? How can you understand maybe even how to invest if you don't understand the moves of the kind of companies that can help shape it? The example of if you're not using Google right now is, uh, well, I don't know how do you manage things around, right? Is it so helpful? Is it such a powerful solution and i think this is going to happen uh you know in a time frame shorter or um, longer but it definitely is coming is huge and it'll be exactly uh how the world look like uh in terms of uh, environment right i think metaverse is going to be the main environment there and mm -hmm. i know you have a uh, um, big passion for that and i yes. want to ask you um is this uh, the biggest industry ever? It will tremendously overtake uh, internet and everything. Yeah, so for us, when we look at Metaverse and Web3, we think of that as the future iteration of the internet. And it will do what the original internet was meant to do, which is provide more equal opportunity, more access, but in an economic manner. One of the problems we had in the first wave of the internet wasn't that it didn't provide a democratic access to information. Everyone had the same information. You can see this with like open source. People were also able to get code and build on top of it. And that was really fun and, and, and provided lots of opportunity. But the value transfer between the people who wrote the code or the people who wrote the content and then those who ended up publishing it or those who ended up using the code was not fairly distributed. If you're a developer in open source, it wasn't that you were paid a royalty for making the code you were actually hired by the company for maybe a good salary. But nevertheless, you didn't necessarily have equity or had very, very small equity, even though maybe your code was a core contributor to the growth of these companies. And when you think about open source, you know, we wouldn't have blockchain if it wasn't for open source. We wouldn't have Google or even Facebook or all of these major companies, Huawei, Lenovo, whatever your name you name it, they were all built with open source. But the developers who wrote that code, how many of them actually got to benefit from the growth? And that's basically what happened in, in some ways. I think of Web 1 and to a lesser degree Web 2 as a kind of barter age of our data and our sort of information. We bartered. We didn't have a money system. But in Web 3, the entire transaction layer, the value system, the value layer is shared across the transaction layer. So that means we can now actually compensate people for that. So the metaverse itself, I think, is the pathway to that. 
But I want to ask you about uh, this part with developers. Do you think all of them are, are literally aware about the impact they have in that particular company? Because at one point, when we talk high-level developers, we talk about six figures uh, wages, right? So um, it's it's quite hard to 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 reject that salary, maybe, right? And and put some part in equity for a long-term thinking and uh, to have this um, mentality of okay, I can play now uh, in a you know with sh- mm, smaller benefits, let's say. But I do believe that this company can become a unicorn billion dollar company and I would like to have one or two percent shares. Do you think is is the mentality out there or they are just, uh, yeah, I'm fine. Let's just give me six figures. I'm fine with that. So I think the, and this is a fascinating thing in Web3, the type of developers or engineers who understand and have financial literacy, they will want equity or tokens or NFTs. doesn't really matter because they understand that capital appreciation isn't a sort of linear model. In other words, if you have value formation and capital formation, it has the potential to grow exponentially in over time if value forms. And if you're the co-contributor and co-creator of that value, then doesn't it make sense for you to have an incentive around that? But if you don't understand it, or you know, worse even, you're just doing the job because of a salary, you're not doing it because you're actually passionate about it, then you probably just want the salary, right? Because it seems safer, you can invest the money the way you want. But I think that's kind of sad in my view because if you join a company, if you have the luxury, let's just be clear, not everyone has a choice. But if you have the choice to work at any company in the world, broadly speaking, why would you choose to work for a company in which you think that your work cannot have impact, in which your work doesn't have the ability to create some value. And I don't mean to say that someone, who, you know, you have to be senior, like a like a, like a a sort of engineer that might appear to be sort of, you know, junior can still have a big impact because they have an idea or they, you know, optimize the code. I mean, these are things that actually add tremendous value. And when you look at startups, many of those engineering teams and startups are not big. So yeah, oh, I'm a junior engineer in a team of 10 engineers. Well, you're still 10% of the engineering force. Yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not like, you know, you're not one out of 1 million or 10,000 or 100,000. You are 10%, right? I mean, that is an impact. And so that means that even if you are a junior, you have a voice. And I feel that people who can work in environments like that feel, leave, sort of have more fulfilling lives. And that's not to say that they will have the same success, right? It never works that way. It's not just because you take more equity and you take more risk, that you necessarily have more reward. But I think the work that you do for that is more fulfilling because you have a mission, you believe in that. And you know, maybe you have to switch jobs and whatever, but I think the lesson you take back is building with purpose. If you build only for salary, then actually your purpose isn't your work. Your purpose probably is maybe you, and again, nothing wrong with it, but maybe you want to build a family, Maybe you want to have lots of holidays. Maybe you like to have nice cars. Like That's all okay. Yes. But if that is your passion and purpose, then the kind of work you do probably will be different. But I will say this. I think every company um, should strive to bring people who want to build what you're building, to share in this vision. I think we, if we have those people, we should be very lucky and we should obviously treasure them. But also that means we need to reward them in the form of whether it's tokens, equity, or whatever because they will be your um, your, your champions uh, in common purpose. Absolutely, yes, indeed. Um, in terms of metaverse, um, I know Animoca holds a lot on uh, in the market. I mean, mm-hmm. you put a lot of uh, bets out there, right? Mm-hmm. Is this in purpose of something that uh, is your this strong belief that you see metaverse at the um, uh, status quo of the society in the yes. next... 20 years, let's say, right? Or after 20 years from here, or maybe even earlier. Can we call Animoca Brands the black of, of uh, Metaverse? <laughs> you owning almost like 90% of all Metaverses? Uh, so no, I'm, I'm not sure we own 90% of the Metaverses, but obviously, you know, we're big supporters of, you know, other side. Obviously, we're investors in Decentraland. We own the Sandbox. 
you know, obviously with Mokaverse, uh, you know, we're also, you know, a big investors in Upland and so on. So, so yes, we do back um, all of these platforms and all of these metaverses, but we don't do it because we want to control it, um, because in many cases we're minority investors. We do it because we believe in the future where we all become effectively digital citizens, obviously in conjunction still with government systems, but digital in the sense that we have sovereignty over digital assets, that we can make you know, and share the real value of our digital time and assets, as I mentioned in the previous podcast yes. with you. So that's fundamental. And the only way we think we can do that effectively is in the open metaverse powered by Web3 because it needs blockchain technology. And think about how much time we spend online today. We spend most of our time online, but think where all the value goes. That value does not go to the end user. Uh, it goes primarily to the platform and we get nothing for it. And there's something ironic around this, right? Because people often blame capitalism for, well, you know, Apple and Facebook and all these companies, they take all the value and, you know, it's because of capitalism. But there's something ironic about this. And this is why I think Web3 and the open metaverse will solve this. Is that actually what the platforms have done, what Apple and Facebook and Google have done, is that they've actually taken away capitalism. Because capitalism is a free market in which the parties have the freedom to determine the true value between each other. But who determines the value of an ad spend? Who determines the value of a like or a friend? Who determines what you get to see and what you don't get to see? The platform. The AI of the platform has now become the ultimate market manipulator. And that's not a market. That's basically a, you know, from my perspective, actually almost socialist. ICN Talks today is brought to you by our friends, Eternity Group. With Eternity Group, guys, you are not just get, getting a service provider, you are gaining a partner with legacy of reliability and horizon of opportunities. From securing your business license, company bank account, to opening doors to golden visas, and even diving into futuristic realms of crypto, blockchain, virtual assets, all these sort of new domains, Eternity Group is the right compass you need to have these things done fast, easy, and most importantly, in a professional manner. With offices in London and here in Dubai, they can custom and tailor international services, legal guidance, and innovative financial solutions. It will pave the way for a global business footprint for you. If you are looking to opening businesses, uh, new businesses here in the UAE, consider to reach them out. At contact at eternitygroup.co. Their CEO, Mr. Rafi Vartanian, born and raised here in Dubai, very well connected, will understand perfectly what you're looking for and what you need. Contact at eternitygroup.co. Shout out to Eternity Group for their uh, great services. Right now, is is just a matter of you giving two, three likes to a certain type of content, and then your entire feed is full of that particular content. Yes. Correct. That's that's pretty much everything in social media right now. Yeah, but I think algorithm. yes, but I think the the point on this is, is that it is not based on what you like really. It's based on what they think you should like, and that means our freedom of choice has been taken away from us in a way, right? It's you know one sense you could say well you don't have to use a platform, but that's a little bit like saying well when I step out of my home, I basically am confronted with all of the news and media and article from things that I don't care about, but eventually it obviously influences me, or that the only channel I can see are the kind of news that they want you to see. So the other way to look at it is kind of the worst kind of propaganda as well, right? You know, again, we, we need to have the freedom to basically see what we want to see, and we have to also have the freedom to unsee the type of things that, you know, we think are abusive to us. So the metaverse, because it's built on Web3 and blockchain, particularly the open metaverse, provides ways in which you can have a free and open market, an actual market between participants. And the reason we have multiple metaverses, and we think there will be thousands of them, is because we think of them like cities and nations. Meaning that, you know, the sandbox is kind of a country. Axie Infinity is kind of a country. Pixels is a country. Upland is a country. In a sense that they have their own communities. Some may be dual citizens, but you don't have time to be dual citizens in all of them. You create economic activity, you can trade with each other. There's a society that's been built because there's real economic value. And they have different governance structures that may suit us. Uh, no different than when we think of sort of L1 and L2s as well. And you know the value that can be generated, which we see today, is in many cases bigger than what they can do in the physical world. 
and therefore we think of that as a natural path of progression. The entire Web3 space, when you see the value underpinned by tokens such as Bitcoin, is about $1.6 trillion today, which is significant. And there's hundreds of billions of dollars that is basically traded between them. The economies are now the scale of reasonably sized countries. Yeah. And we are still only very, very in relative percentage of the world at an adoption, at a true adoption that is only in the single digit percentage. When it comes to adoption, um, w we see that the process of mass adoption is quite um, like a pattern, right? In, it happened in many industries. First, they need to hear about it, right? Then they need to uh, get in touch to understand it. Ah, okay, is this one, uh, now it makes sense for me somehow. And then they have the curiosity to uh, connect and uh, you know use that product somehow. And eventually they like it and they stay there and they consume, right? Correct. What's, what's the stage right now with Metaverse? I mean, we are in the early adopter stage. So if you're familiar with the diffusion... I mean, if you like, if you will be in position to explain Metaverse to um, 75 uh, years old grandma, <laughs> what would you say? What's, what's Metaverse? To me, Metaverse is the digital society. Um, it's a society of the future underpinned by digital property rights which if you think about it, is really how a physical society works. A physical society is underpin underpinned by a form of property rights that we have physically so that we can have the democratic institutions and the capitalist institutions that we have today. And I think one of the difficulties that maybe a 75-year-old might have, and again, it's just a generalization, is that he might say, well, this is entirely virtual. How can this be society? How can you make money from this? You anyway, know, they are not the market. I mean, the, the uh, metaverse is not for the 70 years it, old It, it may not be, uh, but people, I guess yeah, the thing obviously. that I would counter and I would say is, well, why does your physical property have value? And why does your assets have value that you think you can hold and touch? Who gave you the right to own this property? And what is money? And actually, at the end of the day, it is a shared reality. It is a common fiction that we tell ourselves, that we agree, yes, the US dollar has this value. We agree that as a society, if I own this house and the government confirms it, then it is my house. Because if the government doesn't exist, then that house is not your house. It is only someone else's house until someone else takes it, right? So there is a societal framework that is held together by common fiction. And the fiction of the future if you want to call it that, is the metaverse. But I don't mean that just as stories. I mean that as humans, we live on these stories. We are created um, and exist on sort of the fantasy and the hope that these stories create. What is democracy? It's a story that we like, that we believe in. Right? What is property rights? Right? What is freedom? I mean, you know, what is free will? Again, these are many philosophical questions one might have, but at the end of the day, they're human stories because most people agree that we should be free and most people agree that we should own our property and most people will agree that a democracy is better than maybe a dictatorship that's why we can have that shared reality but you know democracy isn't that old most of humanity did not exist in a truly democratic system when you think about it so in some ways we are still living in a grand experiment that is evolving over time and so that's my point that for the 75-year-old, he's living a story that is a story of the past from his perspective that he believes in. But the younger generation is living a new story that is more powerful and more impactful, not just to them, but their, to their respective futures. And that's one of the reasons why I think also the metaverse will be so much more powerful because the actual facts of this is that because so many people believe in this and want this to happen, the actual... Uh, our economic opportunities and the business opportunities that come from it are significantly more valuable and powerful than, than anything else. Do you think the advertisement in the Times Square in the metaverse will be more expensive than actually advertisement in the Times Square itself? I think it's already happened. We don't think it's more expensive because we think of the single spend. But how much does Apple and Google and Facebook make in advertising? And it's more than any billboard put together. So I actually think the virtual advertising is already much, much bigger than the physical one. We just don't think it 
of that way because maybe a small business can spend a hundred dollars on it, but the aggregate value of online advertising is already a, a juggernaut. I mean, I obviously we are on the same page. I have the same belief as you. This is not a matter of if we want to come or not. Is you really you need to adapt or uh, because it's not up to you if it's coming or not. It's coming right. and it's huge. And uh, we will see the prices on, for example, uh, Vision Pro, right? Mm. Apple Vision Pro, and you'll have a small icon here yes. with uh, whatever, uh, you know, health uh, training or whatever, right? A fitness training uh, advertisement. A way to see the prices for that. I mean, it will, it's, yes. uh, it's uh, unbelievable. And also, I think we have to Expensive. understand that nothing is free. So... By the time that a Vision Pro device is able to serve you advertising in this manner and the price of the Vision Pro will go down, that's only because the value of the advertising or the value of the services delivered by the device is worth more. Right? So there's a balance. At the end of the day, there's still an economic balance that has to be struck for making these products uh, sustainable. And, and, and just to clarify, you know, we think devices like the Oculus and the Vision Pro are really you know, amazing devices but they're not the metaverse itself, just to be clear, right? There are ways in which we can access Tools to access, yeah. Exactly, absolutely. tools to access, yeah. but not actually the metaverse. And I think yeah. a lot of people get confused by this. And I think sometimes, and that's why we focus on digital property rights as a narrative, is that metaverse has, been, has become a term that has been confusing to people. Because when you listen to you know, Facebook or Meta, then they make it sound like it's their platform. And they make it sound like it's about the Oculus. Right? And then you have Apple. It's like, no, there's no such thing as metaverse. You know, it's spatial computing. Right. It's <laughs> something completely different. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and then, you know, we have our definition of the open metaverse powered by Web3. But again, it still has the word metaverse. And so many, many people have different interpretations of the metaverse. And I think that is part of the problem uh, where the narrative isn't really straightforward. So I do think we do need to think about how we better communicate it. How is um, mockaverse uh, different than metaverse? Well, the Mochaverse is an identity solution and a way in which we can provide a unity amongst our 450 portfolio companies and the millions of users on our platform, various platforms, into one common framework so that we can aggregate network effects. One of the most powerful things about Web3 is that you have access to these network effects where you can build and compose freely upon them. But it is somewhat difficult to you know, string together the network effects of 10, 20, 30 different companies even though they're freely available, uh, which of course wasn't possible in Web2. But with Mochaverse, we hope to do that in a way where just through Mochaverse, you can access not only the Animoca portfolio, but generally the Web3 world. And we do this with the identity solution because I think one of the most important things as well, have a functioning societal metaverse. You need to have trust. And to have real trust, you need to have identity, but not identity in terms of I need to know everything about you, mm. but that I can trust you. Right. Think of so literally, it will be the same digital avatar going exploring um, all the um, portfolio, right? Yes, but it doesn't have to be an avatar. It's not a physical avatar. It's just an identity solution that knows your Mochaverse ID holder. Mm. I can trust you, and then you can use it for, you know, first for your games, uh, maybe for airdrops and benefits because I know what kind of gamer you are. But then in the future, you know, it could even be for financial services or anything like that, if that makes sense, because it is a user profile. One of the powerful things about blockchain is sort of, you know, permissionless trust, right? The ability that I can transact with strangers around the world. I don't need to know who they are. I don't need to know anything about them, but I can do a transaction and the transaction itself I can trust, even if the counterparties I don't know, right? So it removes these questions about sort of, you know, physical counterparty trust issues that we have. But the next level, if I want to extend those businesses, I need to know a little bit more about how much I can trust you. And in society, we have laws that help us protect that. For instance, if you're a citizen or you have a business reputation or if you're credit rating, those are ways in which I can identify whether you are good to do business with. Do, your friend, do my friends say he's a good guy or is he a bad guy? I, when I search him on the internet, is he you know, good reputation, bad reputation, you know, all that kind of stuff. We do lots of manual work. We don't really have a good way of, of doing this. And you know, credit ratings are not available generally for public consumption. But with a Mocha ID, you can now do that just with the Mocha ID, but you can also do that in a, in, a, in a manner where the end user can only give you access with certain permissions. So for instance, I don't need to know 
what your name is. I don't even maybe need to know how old you are or where you live, but I do know that you can be trusted because you have done you know, many transactions in the past. And I only know, as this is how zero knowledge proof would work, that you know, 20 other people that I trust, trust you too. But I still don't know your name. But now I can do business. Yeah, those layers of trust. Exactly, in front, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and that's actually how society works, right? Yeah. You know, I, I go into a dealership and I buy a car. I mean, think about it. I buy a car from a complete stranger I've never met before. Why do I trust the stranger that the car I buy will actually work? 20 right. friends of mine told me about Yes, it. and because the shop is in the big area, yeah. and because it's the brand and there's endorsement. So there's multiple facets that give you a confidence of trust. But in a digital world, and especially you know, with the history of scams that have happened in Web3, we need a system that can help solve that. And that's basically what the Mochaverse is trying to do. And you know, we have, you know, at this point, close to half a million active users already you know, from a very, very recent launch. So that's actually a, a good growth number, and I think we'll hopefully get to a million very soon. And uh, you know, we, it's a way for people who play our games. You know, we made over 150 game investments at this point. Uh, for them to basically accelerate in the space, right? Where, you know, how do I, do I KYC mm. every single, you know, user every single time with a new wallet? Or can I just use a Mochaverse ID, which already is KYC'd and is verified? It's much easier for game publishing. It's much easier for launches. I think the challenge here will be um, uh, moving to the second stage, yeah? Because they first, obviously, will will hear about Metaverse. And I think uh, a good percentage in the world right now I think at least one time they heard about the word metaverse, right? But then it's a matter of understanding, okay? What's metaverse exactly? And mm -hmm. how can I benefit somehow? It is mm -hmm. fun or is it, what it is it exactly, right? Yeah. And this part of understanding, it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, with what range of audience we are talking to when we expect them to understand. So I think here is, is uh, uh, younger than 25. These are the ones that are going to actually be the real user. So uh, it's a matter of time. It's a matter of uh, at least 10 years to, to have this uh, absorb uh, right. so process. I actually think, right, so I actually think it will happen much faster. But I think the reason I say this is because we're kind of in the sort of immigrant stage of the metaverse, shall we say, right? So people like you and me, we're in the metaverse. We invest in the space. We see it. We use it. We're not that same generation. We're kind of like immigrants, right? We're kind of, you know, it's like if you can think of, a, if, if I was to use a parallel, I would say, you know, the open metaverse is like, you know, America hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. And we're all European settlers that have basically sort of migrated to sort of this new America, this new land, as it will, to basically build, you know, something new, right? And we're the immigrants. And of course, you know, in this virtual environment, um, in this case, you know, we have the next generation. And they're born entirely virtual. And they actually don't know, you know, in a sense, not physically, but in the sense of their mind and what they do. Because the first thing they do is use digital devices and their friends are digital and they're all online. Exactly, And, yes. and that's, com it's, 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 uh, it's very um, sort of common to them. But that doesn't mean that the audience is primarily going to be younger. Actually, I think what happens is, is that the more natural age is, is that as people get older, they get dragged in because of the younger generation. One of the reasons why so many technology companies invest and focus on technologies that are built for young people. Think about the history of Facebook, which is really kind of, a kind of, you know, like, um, I guess, in some ways, a, you know, dating rating sort of application you know for harvard harvard kids back in the day right or when you think about some of the earliest applications they're really social applications geared towards younger people and that's not only because young people are trendsetters it's also because young people are basically setting the scene for the future right if you build a product that is appealing for 20 25 year olds or let's call it 30 year olds you've built a market for the next 20 30 40 years if you build a product for someone who's 80 or 90, the life cycle of that customer is just going to be shorter. Right? Exactly. Like, That's uh, why I meant. Like yeah. uh, they are the user and the journeys of the future. You'll take them yes. from 20s and literally you play with them for the next 50 yeah. years. And that's the story of gaming. Right? Yes. When people who play games in the 80s and 90s, they don't stop playing games when they get older, which is one of the reasons why gaming on macro 
has been such an incredible growth story. But staying on building, to build literally, um, you know, uh, excitement and metaverse, right? Like uh, literally to have fun there, to be a quality one, you need infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very key element right yes. there. In terms of infrastructure, um, where do you see right now? And we've seen in the last uh, period, six months, uh, literally an explosion of layer twos, right? Mm. Um, at the technical solution, why do you think layer two uh, have um, um, a better solution than layer one? And why do we need layer two at the end if we have layer one? So first, I wouldn't sort of distinguish layer one, layer two quite in that pattern. I do understand the frameworks around it though. I think of layer one and layer twos as kind of nation states in the sense that there's communities that form around them that appreciate them for whatever reason, because of ownership, because of culture, because of identity, they attach their identity to it. And that strong sense of identity essentially is what forms a community which you can build and compose new businesses and opportunities on top of it. So, you know, when you take a look at Bitcoin, as an example, I would say it's a very unique community. And I wouldn't say that just because you know, there is a arguably better technology or faster technology, whether this is on Ethereum or Solana or whatever, that the Bitcoin user will switch. So we ask ourselves the question, why? I mean, isn't it illogical? Don't you want the fastest chain? Don't you want the so-called best chain? And that's because the people who follow Bitcoin don't just follow it because of speed and efficiency. They follow it because of its principles because of what it means and what it means for, you know, for them, proof of work is very important. It's not necessarily important for other people, but it's very important because it is for them, sort of, I guess, uh, philosophically, the truest form in which you can sort of have access because you work for it, right? It is the sort of most classic definition of, I guess, digital labor. So that's one, one reason. And the other reason, of course, is the fact that you know, from the perspective of decentralization and the way that the governance works, which is in this case, you know, hash rates and power around that is, is something that um, they value above all. And so um, the principal philosophical reasons why they follow Bitcoin is a reason they will not move to any other chain and it has nothing to do with speed or efficiency. And I, I see the same with Ethereum, for instance, which is that just because you have, you know, immutable, and you have Polygon and you have... You know, optimism, um, optimism, and yeah. optimism, all you know, like yeah. amazing tech and arbitrum. Uh, yeah, exactly, uh, important and, and yeah. critical. Uh, that doesn't mean that an Ethereum user will use one or the other necessarily, unless there's a reason for an application, because they themselves are invested in the Ethereum ecosystem that generates a certain kind of value in which they have a certain belief system that doesn't make it easier for them to switch to the other. I mean, there are people today, for instance, I know that will never buy an NFT unless it's on Ethereum. In their mind. Yes, indeed. Yeah, because they will say an Ethereum NFT is the only thing that's real. Why? Well, because they assume it as its value. And it's kind of like saying, you know, I, you know, I won't buy, you know, um, any type of, you know, I won't buy any type of sort of, you know, alcoholic drink if it's, or a wine if it's not from France or something, you know, <laughs> because yeah. that's the origin. I mean, you know, lots of people make good wines, um, but maybe because the grapes were originally from the French Valley and it's imported around the world, it's not real, right? For some people, it matters. And so that's why I say uh, it's related not only about technology and speed or efficiency, because whether it's wine, whether it's cars, whether it's all forms of culture, or whether it's L1 and L2, right? The things that we value and the things we find important are different from person to person. I want to ask you one thing about uh, the Bitcoin community because this is a very interesting one. Mm. I want to, to see your touch here. Okay. Do you think they live somehow, because the narrative behind is we are going to be independent to the banking system and we can you know, play around. Right as much as we want. A certain community. Yeah. A certain community. Yeah, yes. a small percentage of that. Die-hard fans, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think they live in La La Land with this kind of approach? I mean, uh, it's a matter of, at the end, um, it's a matter of control, right? From the above, very, very uh, top, right? Elites, how they call it, right? How so, likely yeah. is the scenario when uh, such a tool 
in nowadays can be Bitcoin after 50 years can be something else. But do you think is it possible something to to have this power to totally uh, to be totally independent from the entire world? So first, I don't think there can be any system that is truly sort of separated from the entire world in one sort of system or the other, as in fragmented. Because as humans, we're social and we're kind of always interconnected in one form or the other. So regardless of you know what one community wants to help see matter, um, I also by the you know I don't think that that is going to be the likely outcome. But also I don't think that you know whether you call them Bitcoin maximalists actually necessarily think that that is the ultimate outcome. Like I don't think they necessarily wish for the collapse of you know um, society, for instance. Nor do I think that they they want sort of you know like countries to end or that kind of stuff, right? Um, but what I do think they really want is uh, in in this perspective is they want to have their vision of their version of freedom sort of their version of liberty um, and their version of property rights upheld in a manner that cannot be abused by central powers right that is a big tenet around that the beginnings of the american constitution had actually very similar flavors right when when you think about sort of how the constitution was built it was about creating a balance a check in terms of the balance of power between those that wield power and the population in itself right so the right to bear arms as an individual person um, you know, in America is a very controversial topic, of course, anywhere else in the world. But in some ways in the U.S., and again, I am not um, endorsing it, but the perspective is that that's my liberty. It's my freedom. It's, it is my right to have that, and no government in the world should have the right to take that away from me. You know, whether you agree or not, it's a, it forms part of that belief system. Yet, who created Bitcoin? Well, there's a story that everyone knows. I mean, (laughs) how much weight do you put behind Satoshi being a real person? You know, I don't speculate about that too much. Um, And I think the reason why I don't speculate about that is because I think the story that is out there is legend. And the birth of Bitcoin to me is no different than the birth of mythology and legends that we live on. And I go back to this original thing that I said, which is that Humanity lives on stories. It lives on legends. So you don't want to, you don't want to interfere in that uh, storytelling. No, I don't. You don't want to. I don't. And I think it's it a, and I think way. it's a it's a storytelling that is magical, mm. and that magic is what pushes people forward. And you know, the stories about maybe it's many people, maybe it's not one individual, um, maybe it's whoever, whatever. But you know, actually, it doesn't matter to me. I think the fact that. There is a mythology around it. And to me, this is also how we think of historical archetypes as well. Like, you know, we, we, we look at the historical archetypes of, you know, Greek history and Greek gods or Norse gods, right? And, you know, we accept that they are not true religions in the sense, and we accept that, you know, they're But we mythology, like the story. But we love the story yeah. because they say something about us. They say something about our values. They say something about you know, what we want to achieve as humanity. And we retell the stories, right? Because back then, the written word wasn't possible because people didn't know really how to write. Most people didn't know. So the entire stories was oral. And so in some sense, mythology and legends are actually the first forms of virality, right? They're the viral stories of their time. They didn't have technology to broadcast the way they do today, but they are the stories that we dream and live on. And then we fashion ourselves against them. So do you think it really doesn't matter who is behind the creator? I don't think it matters at all. I don't think it matters at all. I think the story and the proof of of what it represents is much bigger. And if this is such a beautiful uh, story created, then the next question is, who on our planet right now is the like who are the greatest uh, marketers? Who are the greatest storytellers? <laughs> well, I think um, I think you can tell who would be good storytellers, right? Everyone in the market or anyone in place around is, you know, leadership, I think, is around good storytellers. So, you know, um, even though maybe, you know, someone like Elon Musk um, is not maybe someone who is a great speaker, per se, he tells a compelling story about his version of the future. Yes. And that's why, you know, many people follow him and many people believe in what he does. But at the end of the day, and this is why I really love the story of Bitcoin and similar stories like it, is that the story is greater than the person itself. 
And when you think of what happened with these L1 and L2s and the mushrooming of many more different type of blockchain technologies, the vision of Bitcoin is actually why they did it. It's the root of it. And it's ultimately that story that has led to the mushrooming and the branching of many little stories that have basically become, you know, the stories of, you know, our world, shall we say, and one that we can't really remove because it's so deeply ingrained in our psyche and in some ways the way that we want to shape the world. That's why I strongly believe it, it can't be, it's impossible to be one person. It's well, impossible to build something like this. So... You know, I don't know that. Uh, I mean, you can you can build great stories in your room in front of your computer, but the execution to be at the, this global level with this kind of implications. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's different. It's uh, totally something else. This is different story that yeah. we've been told. Yeah. So I, I I don't know, of course, but the way that I've seen stories unfold in history is that when the story is no longer just your story then it becomes truly great. So some people call this user-generated content. That's a little version of that. But actually, it's how we take one story and retell the story in our own way, and we bring people in. And again, Bitcoin is the first story, but every L1, L2 is a version of the story. Of course. Right? And of course. so that branching of those stories has become basically like an open source movement of basically what, what, what blockchain has become. Even and the creators, I don't, I mean, at the starting point, I don't when think they, they created, saw this. I don't they, think they saw this. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Like, yes. this is, now they, they literally, they need to adapt. Well, they need to adapt. The, the things are going yes. to... But I think that's the sign of something truly great is if it's grown beyond you and has become bigger than you. Mm. And I think this is what, you know, this is what blockchain is. Yeah. And, you know, blockchain as a technology is actually not, you know, in and of itself, the thing that pushed it forward. We, we obviously know what the technology can do. It's actually the story of Bitcoin that opened up the imagination of what this technology could do and everything else that formed around it. So in that sense, I would say, you know, I'm very grateful for it, obviously, but I also believe that uh, it really doesn't matter. I think uh, we should be just happy that this narrative belongs to all of us. It doesn't belong to a small set of people. But in, in a in a back end in our minds as a humans, why do we think do you think we are chasing money so much? So, because this is a, this is a m m money driver narrative, right? Like mm. buy now, <clears throat> at, uh, you know, a cheaper price because tomorrow can be. This is yeah, something so that I don't works agree. very well. So first, I don't agree that it's necessarily all a, a money driven narrative, but I think one thing that most of us seek that's not true for all of us most of us seek is uh, social status, social identity, and respect, right? And when you look at basically sort of, you know, I guess the classic sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Once we've, you know, once we've taken care of all of our basic needs, then what we seek for is love and understanding and community, basically social status, and social connection, right? And we see many cases where, you know, this is independent, obviously, of, of blockchain, that we're unwilling to create social suicide. In fact, you know, do things that is maybe against society that you're in because the social suicide is even maybe more painful than other kinds of actual um, sort of suicide because of the fact that the ostracization of that or the removal of being detached or maybe the community that you're so connected to has become so important and valuable. Like we've seen, we've seen several examples of that, uh, you know, in history. So what is money? Well, in this case, money becomes for most people a representation to get to the kind of social status and social community and connection that you seek. For some people, money is the end, sure, but that's a very small number. For most people, money is a means to an end, and that means to an end is the social status we speak of. So when you know, someone wants to own Bitcoin or when someone wants to be involved in a new economic opportunity, they do it because they hope that they can be free, maybe have financial freedom and have options in their life, or maybe pursue a romantic interest or have, you know... As a successful as a, individual. As, exactly, as yeah. successful individuals. And it is about trying to sort of get to a point where you have that sort of, you know, individual freedom. But of course, as we know, in this world, and especially in, the, in, in recent times, it's gotten harder for people to sort of 
sort of unshackle themselves and have a have a state where where they where they can get to have this kind of financial freedom, which is by the way one of the reasons why which we disagree with. Some people have come about and sort of become anti-capitalist and have said, hey. You know, the whole system of money is rigged and it's bad and capitalism is bad and we need to get to a point where, you know, you know, we don't have that. Which, by the way, is how, you know, socialism started and the Communist Manifesto and, you know, the ideas that Karl Marx put forward were the diagnosis was correct. It was correct, you know, over 100 years ago and it's correct today. But the outcome, I think, is, is, is you know, the solution is, is not but I think, again, I go back to this, um, this point about to your question, why do we seek it? What we seek is the sort of the higher levels of social understanding and social status, you know, love and feelings and connection. That's what we really want. And right now, money has been, money is sort of the way in which we can either get there or maintain it or defend it or, or have that, right? When you ask most people, especially, let's call it reg, sort of, anyone on the street what do you really want right often they'll say i want a happy life mm. i want the good life what is the good life well the good life is maybe it's having a family you know being able to afford food and bring safety to the home and sort of you know spend for time some with cars for some owning an entire tower or maybe build uh, you know Uh, billions and billions of well, dollars, companies and stuff. Yeah, so I don't. So, but talking about money. But but just let me please. let me address that first. I, I think that while there may be a you know a small set, there are a set of people who 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 want what you just mentioned, but for them it's also status, right? It's Absolutely. Just, but it's power in this case, right? It's a it's a kind yeah. of status that is sort of you know excessive almost, but to the point where you know they have this ambition, and while on one hand you could say. That's obviously positive. It brings you know um, you know progress and so on. Um, there needs to be a counterbalance towards that as well. I think because I think that's one of the problems that we've seen in um, in the way that the current form of capitalism has created so much inequity. Which, by the way, I think Web three can can help shape uh, shape and change. Talking about money, what would be the the price which I have to pay to become hundred percent shareholder of Animok? <laughs> Right. So, I is there any price for that to to take yet from Animoca and say, so you've been acquired? So, first of all, um, just to clarify one point: Animoca is a public company, and I am not the majority shareholder of Animoca. So, you know, if you can sort of buy the shares in the market from other people, then there's a way for you if you want to take over the company. It's kind of no different than the DAO in some ways, right? If you want to take over the DAO, you have to pay for it. But of course. The value will increase, it might be harder, all that kind of stuff. But I can safely say that for myself, I have no interest in selling my stake because I think that you know, what we're building with Animoca is very important for the world in the sense that I think we're helping shape it uh, in a way that I think Web3 can really have a major impact. And I want to be able to continue to do that. And I think um, very few times, um, and I think this is again part of where I think our mission is, Do we find ourselves in a place as individuals that we can help shape an industry and shape a space? Often we can be lucky that we can just be there at the right moment, right time. But how often can you say that you're actually in a position to help shape it in what you think is a better world? That and to, to me trade that for any amount, it it's, doesn't make it, any sense. It, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's, it's something that I, I truly believe that we're, what we're trying to build with digital property rights is going to make a better world. I think it will solve the problems we have with capitalism. I think it gives more equity to the world. And, you know, no amount of money can, I think, change that for us. Yeah, indeed, it's a beautiful vision. I think is the, the only way to, to have a chance, at least, to build something at this scale. Exactly. And also, in Web3, blockchain, crypto, there is no industry I can think of where a regular person can find economic opportunity. Even when AI was growing the way that it was, and people were using it, obviously, who became shareholders in OpenAI or these AI companies? Who were participants and benefited from the financial growth of these companies? The answer is only the VCs and the 0.001 percentile. And that's one of the reasons why also I think Web3 and blockchain and crypto is coming back as strong as it is not just because of spot ETF and because of the capital markets adoption and so on, but because, again, 
it is the only way in which mass participation, uh, there can be a way to grow um, you know, economically in a mass participatory way. Blockchain and Web3 is the only way, as I can see it right now. I want to touch um, in the last, uh, uh, let's say, uh, time frame of our podcast right now, yes. right? Um, this part with AI. Yes. Because it's important and is obviously is um, uh, highly attached to our industry, right? With so many implications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you see it as a dangerous tool? And how likely do you see, for example, a scenario where AI itself can become a shareholder of a company? So, fascinating question. So first of all, I don't, on a net basis, I don't think AI is dangerous, but like with all technology, you have pros and cons, right? I mean, you've got, you know, the dark side of the internet and you've got the light side of the internet. But broadly speaking, the internet brought so much more progress despite the fact that there were dark sides. And I think the same is true for Web3 and crypto, right? You know, blockchain technology had facilitated a lot of bad things, as we know, but on a net basis, it, I think, had provided sort of broadly, you know, much more benefits to society and all those who are affected. Like when you look at Philippines or Venezuela, you know, or other countries around the world in, in particular. So, so I think the same is going to be the case for AI. The question about whether AI can become a shareholder, it's not that far away today in the sense that AI bots are already buying tokens and trading, but on whose behalf? But this to me, by the way, is where I think the identity layer is interesting because I don't think any time in the near future that an AI can actually be a citizen in itself. You know, because in order for them to be able to do that, they need to have rights. But I don't think we're at a point in time where an AI will have independent rights so that they can do that. But the AI agent will act on someone on someone's behalf because the AI that does that is the property of someone. And I think this is where the ultimate accountability standard comes in. Because in the same way that AI needs to, you know, where the AI gets its materials and shares value, you know, you need blockchain to sort of certify the authenticity of the ownership of the person. I think the same thing will happen with, you know, an AI who does something, the owner of that AI, or the one who sort of launched it, has to be accountable for it. Yeah, but we, now we go um, farther, yeah? We go uh, 2055, right? And the world is exactly this. You connect, you are part of certain environments, you go there, you have digital identity and stuff like that, right? <laughs> Those tools, we call them now AI, but uh, in that period will be like such a natural stuff, right? Yeah, to to I connect mean, and interact. How do you make the difference? Because that, that AI can become... Uh, a sort of self-awareness that he's AI and will take a, a, a proper name, a proper identity, and you think, ah, okay, it's Patrick uh, Williams, but it's uh, totally something else. While I think that AI... And can become shareholder, can do whatever he right. or she wants. So even if the AI can become a shareholder in name, the question becomes whether the AI will actually have, in the legal framework... A property right. And I don't think that we have frameworks, and I think we're not prepared to discuss frameworks, yeah. that AI actually can be an independent, um, an in, a sort of an independent person, how you might describe it. And AI could become a legal entity, but the legal entity of the AI still needs to be owned by someone. And so I think the AI can act on the benefit of behalf of someone in the future. But I don't think the AI can be a shareholder in itself. Um, it could be a collective. So an AI could be owned by a company or by a corporation or even a DAO. And the DAO itself, the owners of the DAO can benefit from it and get the value and the AI acts on their behalf. I think that will definitely happen much sooner than we think. But still, it, you know, everything we're building right now, despite people talk about Terminator and you know, <laughs> like, you know, future of technology and like how AI will sort of of course, crazy stuff. our minds yeah. uh, uh, yeah. Again, are free to explore. Uh, and that's exactly what's fascinating about yeah. us humans because we are master storytellers and we tell ourselves good and bad stories. Is that all of this technology we're building still serves a human purpose. No matter how smart or how conscious we think the AI will be, in the end, the AI is built to serve a human purpose. We look at art that's created by Midjourney and it looks beautiful, but the AI is not the one that's saying, that's beautiful art. It's a human that's being delighted. When we are using AI and giving it its value by 
sharing problems and trying to understand stuff. The kind of questions we're asking and the information we want is to serve a human purpose. It's not to serve an AI purpose. So, well, that, that will be an ideal scenario. But also we need to be aware uh, that what's, what, what people have access right now in terms of oh, AI of course it'll is just 5% yes. of what yes. is literally AI. Yes. It, in, will, uh, it, will, it will absolutely evolve. Or, and I think there'll be some fascinating things. And I, I just want to give you, uh, I mean, for yeah. people who are watching, I want to give them context of this. Yes. Apple started working on uh, Vision Pro before they launched the first iPhone. Mm -hmm. So this is the time frame these guys are, are playing with this of course, kind of thing. Yes. So what uh, we see AI right now, it's, it's uh, just uh, the 2% of the iceberg going out yes. of the water. So, <laughs> and again, I go back to, I agree that in terms of capacity, it's a tip of the iceberg, but I still go back down to the ultimate uh, sort of question of who owns it and who does it serve, right? Because even if the AI develops consciousness, I, I think the one thing that is different here is that the AI, um, you know, on blockchain, for instance, and with future technology, especially if we get to quantum, for instance, is actually going to be possibly self-perpetuating and it can be independent. And I think that moment, you know, what people describe also as AGI and so on, right? That moment, you know, when that happens, is obviously could be potentially be scary. But again, I, you know, I go back to this sort of ultimate point is that while it runs independently and may exist, you know, on things like blockchain, you know, maybe permanently in some form or fashion. Still in the, a very, very back end of it will be sort of control. Well, right? it, it's, it, the, the, you know, unless we are worried about our own extinction, right? Unless we're saying, well, this is, you know, this is the end of humanity as it were, <laughs> right? Um, the human purpose, is the ultimate purpose that is being built into us. How mm -hmm. do we transcend ourselves in our human experiences? How do we get better as humans? How do we create a good life for ourselves? Like I find it as, as thought-provoking as it is, I don't think an AI will say, what is the good life for me? Right? The good life is still serves a human purpose. I think where bad things will happen is when people who are controlling these AIs, again, malicious thought or evil thoughts or that kind of stuff. Those are human yeah. activities. They're not yeah. necessarily come from an AI in itself. Coming back to reality and uh, what's uh, the beauty of life, right, in our daily basis, um, I want people to, to have a little bit of touch about who Yatsu is in real life. <laughs> so um, I have short questions. Sure. Just a few okay. to wrap it up of the, the episode uh, today. Thank you. So, what's your favorite movie? You know, this is a really difficult question because I don't have a favorite movie in the sense that, you know, movies come and go, right? And, you know, I watch movies for different reasons. Um, so, someone can... Or maybe you have uh, a favorite actor or actress that you like in a specific scene or... I mean, you know, I like actresses like... Uh, like um, I've been a fan of like Helen Mirren, for instance. I mm -hmm. like her roles in the past. I've been a fan of, um, you know, Isabella Jani. Um, you know, I guess I'm just telling my age at this point, right? Um, but, uh, but, uh, but I'm also, you know, um, in some of the roles, like for instance, specific roles, like a movie that I enjoyed a lot was sort of, you know, The Edge of Tomorrow, which is, uh, you know, Tom Cruise. I can't say that I'm a Tom Cruise fan, but I liked him in that movie, for yeah, instance, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, that, that type of stuff, right? Um, you know, I, but also, you know, I, I, you know, when I was younger, right, I was a, you know, one of the, the, the series that really shaped my, uh, I guess, a lot of my early thinking as a child was Star Trek, right? Oh, wow. Uh, right? Yeah, and, 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 and I'm talking about the original Star Trek. And, you know, I grew up in Austria. So in the 70s and then 80s, uh, Austrian TV was showing the original Star Trek with, you know, um, Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner, right? The original, you know, sort of um, Captain Kirk and Spock. Uh, while the rest of the world was still, you know, watching Next Generation, right? You know, I was watching the, you know, the 60s show uh, because Austrian TV was, you know, behind, right? Yeah. I guess that was typical for Europe. But, but that sort of, I would say, you know, that was the kind of thing that really had an impact because it was science fiction on TV. Many of the things that were shown in Star Trek, you know, the tricorder, which is the universe, you know, the, the, the universal translator, you know, kind of like a, there was almost like a mini iPad, look kind of like an iPhone-ish type of thing, you know, 
teleportation, you know, traveling in the galaxy. All the elements of the future. All the, kind of yeah. elements of the future, or at least, you know, it was a show that demonstrated um, a hope and a view of the future that was broadly positive. The episodes always ended in a victory, right? Something, yeah. you know, good that happened, right? So I think, you know, if I think back about it, I think those were the pivotal series that helped me shape like sort of some ones. of my thinking. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that I want to go back and watch them now because yeah, they look exactly. dated, yeah. right? But the impact it had on me uh, was, I think, definitely um, uh, very strong. What do you prefer, sunset or sunrise? Depends on my mood. But I would say for broad setting, I think sunrise because I'm always excited for the beginning of the day. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. It's a little bit more softer to me. Okay. Rent or property? Of course, property. No question. Car or driver? Well, so, I mean, uh, I don't know how to drive. So I've never had a driving license. Um, and there was many I reasons. recommend you to take a driver. <laughs> yes. Uh, so therefore, I think I don't have a choice. Yeah. I would say driver. Uh, but I do know that um, I know a lot of people who love driving themselves and want to have a car and great for them. But yeah, it, it's, it's not for me. Well, yet... I uh, we reached the end of uh, the episode today. I'm super grateful you come back, and uh, uh, I I have no words literally uh, for the to express my happiness right now. Uh, being in front of you here, interviewing you for the second time, uh, much appreciated, and uh, thank you so much for uh, coming to ICN Talks. Thank you for having me. It's always a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. Please subscribe if you consider. Smash the like button of um, of the today's episode. And uh, please drop us a comment below. Tell us how did you like the episode, if you have any questions. Don't forget to, to follow us on uh, major social media platforms as Iron Capital News. Thank you so much for watching and see you uh, again on the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. so much.